Good evening, Zoom land friends. We are recording. We're going to record what's going to be a fabulous presentation by Professor Murphy. We will not record the Q&A, however, so that you may feel that you're not going down for posterity, expressing your views on the subject. Um, I'm Linda Kuhn. I'm Dean of the Honors College. And yes, it's a beautiful day, but the Honors College never stops, even for a certain degree temperature, which I won't name right now. And welcome to our first signature seminar sneak preview for the fall 2022 semester. And we are drawing again from our legal talent on this campus, which is amazing. For this time, we are very honored to have Associate Dean of the Law School and Professor of Law, Tiffany Murphy, who also directs the Criminal Practice Clinic at the University of Arkansas School of Law. And as we were discussing a minute ago, Professor Murphy is a great player in service learning who has done remarkable work with law students and also undergraduates. And basically, Professor Murphy is an all around rock star who has an impressive career as a litigant in addition to an academic career. And she has been a vital player of the Innocence Project, which I think many of us know about. And we're gonna hear more about it, I assume, tonight. And we are very honored that Professor Murphy, in spite of her schedule, which is pretty ama amazingly horrendously uh, packed, that she is going to find the time to teach a signature seminar on her field of expertise, and that's on wrongful conviction, innocent, uh, innocence project. And she uh, herself holds an impressive law degree from the University of Michigan, go Wolverines. And so I'm going to turn the mic over uh, to Professor Murphy, who for all of us on camera is going to give a sneak preview of what she does actually as a lawyer and a law faculty member, but what you can expect from this course. Just remember students, and I'll come in at the end and say this again, you do have to sign up to get a seat in this class, and I'm sure there will be a lot of interest. So take it away, Professor Murphy. Thank you so much, Dean. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much for having me and hosting me for this lecture and for the class in the fall. Um, let me uh, kind of give you an overview of what wrongful convictions um, the course is. And, and as I work through this seminar, I usually do not uh, do a lot of lecturing in my classes, um, both at the law school and when I was running um, the two innocence projects and the clinics attached to those. So what I focus on is an engaged conversation about the material um, between myself and my students. Um, I, I think learning happens through the course of a dialogue and questions. So as I go through this, if you have questions, please put them in chat. Um, I, I really want to hear from you. Uh, I, I know a lot of uh, about this material and I could go on and on and on, but I think the most important thing is if you explain to me or you explain what questions you have so that we can have this conversation about this topic. Wrongful convictions is a massive topic. It's, I'm going to cover um, some of the legal principles that undergird this, both why it's so hard to actually get a wrongful conviction overturned, and also how you go about doing that in the court system. So the lecture is going to kind of give you an overview of a very broad topic. And this is something that I spent a lot of time in the course discussing both the legal mechanisms of how this happens, how you fix it, and also the substantive claims that you would bring at various points in the system and why the system is so quick to potentially convict someone who is innocent and then why it takes so very, very long to actually get it fixed, okay? So as I start off, I wanna kind of tell you a story. It's a true story. Um, in October of 1983, a 10 year old boy is attending a church carnival, having fun. And during the course of this time at the carnival, he gets separated for, from his mother and is kidnapped. He's kidnapped by a man and is victimized. 
Um, after several hours, the boy is returned to the carnival where obviously his mother has been looking for him, trying to figure out what's going on and realizes something has happened, horribly has happened to this little boy. She takes him to the hospital where they conduct a rape kit and they collect his clothes. All of this is then turned over to the Tulsa Police Department, who, while properly preserving the physical rape kit evidence, do not refrigerate any of the clothing of the, that, that came from the little boy. Several days later, detectives from the Tulsa Police Department interview the boy and they come to find out that he has um, poor eyesight. But they do take a very detailed description of the incident from the little boy. And so some of the descriptions that, that the little boy was able to get was that the, per the man who took him had a disfigured eye. And of course, my cats decide now is a good time to jump in and participate as well. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, has a disfigured eye. The, the car that he was taken in has two doors. The man had gray in his hair. And all the time that the person was in the car, country music was playing. So this is a pretty detailed conversation, like a, a description of, of, of information for the police to go on, okay? So actually, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and, and talk about how the police then created what's called a photo spread. So give me one second. Okay. So a photo spread is this, and this is the actual photo spread used in the case of, of Larry Youngblood, and I'll show you this picture in a minute. Um, so this is a photo spread. There are several different types of lineups or identification procedures, and this is something that we would talk about extensively in class. So there's your typical lineup, where if you've seen the movie The Usual Suspects, you've got five people kind of in a lineup, and then the person who is the, is the witness is picking out who in that lineup is the, is the person that they saw. The other way to do this is, is what's called a photo spread, and that's what this is. And a photo spread has many pros and cons, um, depending on the officers who are putting this out. And for a person who is a victim of a crime, this may not be the best way to make an identification. But again, this is 1983, and there's a lot of studies that have been done and research that have been done about how you should handle eyewitness identification. Okay, but this is the, the actual photo spread used in the case. And from this photo spread, the little boy picked out a man named Larry Youngblood. And this is him. Larry was then arrested and he had a prior conviction for robbery. So it's not like he had no, you know, no brush with the law before. So he had a prior conviction for robbery. He was arrested, he was charged and with you know, kidnapping, sexual assault, and, and other crimes um, for this incident. He had an alibi. He had people testifying about the fact that his car was four doors, not two doors. He hated country music. Every, like he, had, he presented a defense. In addition to which, he has a disability, making it very, one of his legs is shorter than the other, which would have made it very difficult for him to walk or do any of the things potentially of grabbing this child and running. None of that actually swayed or actually stopped or curtailed the, the overwhelming impact of the little boy identifying him as the man who kidnapped him and, and actually um, assaulted him. And this is actually borne out in, in research and things when you deal with the innocence community and deal with innocence projects in these cases, Eyewitness identification is an extremely powerful thing for jurors to hear. When they hear someone say that is the person who actually did this crime, it overrides any other evidence or any other defense that happens here. One of the defenses that was raised in Larry's case was the fact of the mishandling of the physical evidence. Because of how the, the police, the Tulsa Police Department handled the evidence, they were not able, the defense was not able to do the testing pro 
potentially to show he was not the one who actually kidnapped and assaulted the little boy. And that became a huge issue in the case later on, okay? So one thing I want you to understand is eyewitness misidentification is a factor in 26% of exonerations in this country, 26%. So a quarter of all of the exonerations in this country, and we'll talk about what that looks like in sheer numbers and years, involve people who are wrong, not because they're intentional, not because it's they're trying to pick the wrong person. It happens because we have now become to understand how eyewitness identification is flawed and can be manipulated with through no fault of anyone. But we have to be very careful about how we handle eyewitnesses. So Larry was convicted and put in prison. While his case was pending, he challenged repeatedly in the state system, going through the Arkansas, uh, Arkansas wow, Arizona Courts of Appeal, Supreme Court, and eventually this case made it to the US Supreme Court on how physical evidence should be treated in a case. Okay, so the issue before the US Supreme Court was, did the Tulsa, wow, I'm like so like trying to set it in on like what I have done on my cases in Oklahoma. Uh, does the Tucson, Arizona Police Department's treatment of this evidence violate Larry's due process rights because they did not preserve it correctly? Unfortunately, the Supreme Court did not do the right thing, in my opinion, and ruled against Larry and stated the fact that there was no obligation for the Tulsa or any police department to properly handle physical evidence in a case, even if it would potentially show innocence, unless the inmate, in this case, Larry, could show that the police officers acted in bad faith. This standard is still in, in effect today. So if I had a case where physical evidence was mishandled by a police department, I would have to show intentional bad faith by that police department in the handling of the case, handling the, of the evidence in the beginning to be able to actually preserve that claim to litigate in court. This is almost an impossible burden to meet and evidence is mishandled all the time. And so because of that, Larry ended up doing the rest of his sentence, serving the rest of his sentence, and then he was released. And, but because of the nature of the crime, he had to register as a sex offender, which he refused to do. So he went back to prison, okay? While he was in prison a second time, his attorneys asked for DNA testing. And this is now in 2000. He went to trial and was convicted in 1985. In 2000, they asked for what is now the modern, what we now know as DNA testing, which was not available in 1985. The police, the Tucson Police Department agreed, the prosecutor agreed, and they did the DNA testing. What did they find? Larry did not match any of the DNA found on the clothing, that they could actually test. So he was excluded as the actual perpetrator and was exonerated. 85, 2000. Here's the other part of this problem. When a person is wrongfully convicted, the actual perpetrator is still out on the streets and often still out on the streets committing other crimes. And that's what happened here. So once they had the DNA profile that excluded Larry, they ran it through the database, which is called CODIS, and they found a hit. The man they found who matched it was Walter Cal Calvin Cruz. And he had, after 85, continue to commit sexual assault cases against you know, young boys and other people while he was out. 
So there were additional victims while he was not serving the time that Larry was serving. He was eventually convicted in this case. And as you can see, he was sentenced to 24 years in prison. Okay. Larry was exonerated, but as part of his exoneration, he had to agree to get the DNA testing and the state asked him to waive any potential chances to get any financial re recovery as a part of the DNA agreement, which he did, obviously, because he wanted to be done. So he never received a penny for the time he spent in prison for the crime he did not commit, okay? This is an example of an exoneration and what happens to exonerees once they are potentially released. It's not just that they're exonerated, it's also how do we restore them to the time that they've lost being wrongfully convicted, okay? So that is just a small taste of actually what this looks like on the ground, okay? So let's talk about how, how deep this goes. I see that if there's a, go ahead. Yeah, we, we just had a chat message that said, is there any potential to challenge that Supreme Court ruling in the future? Yes, so, so other people have brought similar claims and the court has not, so the US Supreme Court has extreme discretion on what cases they hear and what cases they choose not to hear. This, this issue has been brought up in other cases. They've not granted what's called a certiorari, meaning they've not agreed to hear it. So as of right now, the Supreme Court has no desire to change this precedent. Okay, so the Supreme Court at any time, if they want to take a case where they wanna review this standard, they could, they have not done so since Youngblood happened um, obviously in the mid eighties. Okay, so let's get an understanding of what we're talking about. What exactly is a wrongful conviction? Because there's a lot of people who don't understand what exactly this term is. This is kind of the, the definition I use at the projects that I run and when I take a case, this is how I kind of explain to people what I'm talking about. A wrongful conviction is a factually innocent person who is convicted and serving a prison sentence, okay? This is not a legal technicality. I've done those cases. I've had plenty of those cases. I still do those cases. But when you talk about a wrongful conviction, it's a very narrow subset. These are people who had no involvement in the crime that they were actually convicted of and are serving sentences for. They're factually innocent, okay? They had no involvement in the crime whatsoever. Okay, so this is how it looks. As of, I believe this morning, there have been since 1989, and 1989 is kind of the, the, the kind of threshold of the DNA move, the DNA exoneration movement from the main innocence project, which is new, in New York, which was started by Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld. Now there's an innocence network with over 60 something, 70 something innocence projects in the nation. So since they started tracking this, and since in 1989 is where we started tracking this, there have been 2,991 exonerations, individual people who have been proven innocent and had to do time. And that's when you think about when you add all those years, all of that time is more than 26,000 years that have been taken from people who had no involvement in the conviction for which they had to do time. The vast majority of these people are state convictions. They're not federal. Some of these people are federal, but most of these, the lion's share of these exonerations are from states. Meaning something happened in a state prosecution that led a person to either through a plea or through a trial and conviction 
be sentenced to something that they did not do. And very much like Larry, most of these people have had some brush with the law before. And it makes it more likely that if something happens again, they're not given all the presumptions of innocence. But please understand, there are people who have had no brushes with the law, who get wrapped up in the system and convicted, okay? So I want you to understand how big this is and how vast the problem is, okay? It's believed to be like one to 2% of any prison population is wrongfully convicted. And we as a nation do convict and incarcerate on a much higher scale than other first, first level countries. We do like our prison complex. And that's a problem when you think about one to 2% conservatively of that population of any prison population is wrongfully convicted. So how does this happen? How do we get here? Two things. There are procedural problems that lead to this, meaning where in the legal process did it break? And then the other procedural problem is once it's broken and a person is actually in prison, how do you fix it? How do you litigate this issue to get the person out? Okay, that's the first chunk of this. How did it break? How did the criminal justice system fail? And then what does the criminal justice system then do to fix this? Okay, that's a first huge issue. And this usually when I talk about this in class takes a, like a month to kind of work through what the system allows us. And I'll give you a very brief you know, overview of something that takes us weeks on weeks to go through. Because I want you to understand it is, that the system is easy to convict. It takes a long time for it to fix itself, okay? It, it does not come to an acknowledgement of innocence very easily. It's usually about five to seven years of litigation to get someone exonerated. That's if you can get someone to do your case. And we'll talk about that as well. Okay. The second is the substantive problems. The actual investigation. How do you actually show a person is innocent? What do you have to prove? And how do you argue this in court so that the court can understand what happened here? because that's what often has to happen because the, also the vast majority of these cases are non-DNA. Of the number that, that 2,991 number we just talked about, only about, 400, about 551 of those cases were DNA. The rest of them are non-DNA cases, meaning it takes a lot of legwork, a lot of resources to show that a person has been wrongfully convicted. So there's not as many DNA cases as you would think. The vast majority of that number are non-DNA cases, meaning there is no physical evidence that you could run through a test and show definitively this person didn't commit the crime. Okay. Are there any other questions or do you want me to keep going? Uh, there are no questions. Okay, awesome. I will keep going then. All right. So how does this happen? So let's talk about the procedure. Let's talk about the trial, okay? This is the first level of how things potentially can break down. And the trial is actually what you would think about. It's somebody is charged with either a information or indictment, depending on the jurisdiction. And most of this, again, is on the state level. These are all state cases I'm going to be talking about. So there's some kind of charging information that explains what charges are against a person, okay? So when we talked about Larry, he was charged with kidnapping and sexual assault, okay? So what is the charge that the prosecutor is bringing against a person? Then you have pretrial. To me, this is the most important aspect of any case any case, because this is usually where things start breaking down. 
if the improper things happen at pretrial. And I'll explain in a second what has to happen here. Then a person will either decide to either go to trial or take a plea. There have been a significant number of exonerees who pled guilty. And it's a cost benefit analysis. And I understand this because if a person is facing life versus a term of years, even if you're innocent, you would potentially take the term of years if you were cost, you know, your cost benefit analysis. So we've exonerated a number of people in the network who pled guilty just so they don't have to spend the rest of their life in prison. Okay. That doesn't, just because a person took a guilty plea does not exclude them from the idea of a wrongful conviction. I get that. So not everybody goes to trial, but a lot of the exonerees did actually go to trial because they're like, I didn't do this. I'm not going to admit to anybody that I did. Okay. So that's what the next step is a trial and or plea. They are convicted. Then they get to go to their first level of appeals. One of the questions I get often is, well, why are there so many appeals? Why do they have so many times? Here's why. The appeals do something different at each phase. They are not the same appeal that you would have over and over again. And as you go up the chain or through the system, the, the number of uh, options that you have are limited, okay? So I'll explain in a second what a direct appeal is and why it is very narrow for most states. Then a person can actually file a petition for writ of certiorari to the US Supreme Court to see if they will take the case, all right? So that's the first phase, meaning you're charged, you go through, you get an, you get an attorney, your Sixth Amendment rights attach, and then you are going through the process, okay? Then you have your trial or a plea, or a plea you have conviction, and then you get your first appeal to the state appellate court, or the if you don't have an appellate court, you would go to the state Supreme Court. Okay, the cert petition to get is discretionary. Don't worry about this. I'm not going to talk about statute of limitations. That's what LOL, SOL means. That's complicated. We'll say that for class. But here's the thing. When I say that pre-trial is where things start to break down, here's why. Two things have to happen simultaneous, simultaneously in pre-trial. The first is the prosecution under the 14th Amendment due process clause has to give you discovery. And often based on state um, criminal rules of procedure, they also have to give you discovery. But the, the Supreme Court has mandated certain things that are exculpatory, impeachment have to be turned over to you pre-trial. That's the first thing. The second thing is under the Sixth Amendment, any defendant is entitled to a zealous defense, meaning their defense attorney should do an investigation, hire experts, do whatever is potentially necessary to actually defend you. So when we talked about Larry's case, his attorneys actually found witnesses, had an alibi, all this information to challenge the prosecution's case. And that's what you want because we have an adversarial criminal justice system, the defense is supposed to do as much as they can to zealously protect the defendant while the prosecution is doing what it can to prosecute. And that's how we end up with a fair trial under our criminal justice system. I see there's a second question. Yeah, we got a question that asks, what percent of people in prison claim to be innocent? Okay, now that's a broader question. And I'll get to that in a second. Give me some time. Let me get through this and I'll talk about what that means and how you actually determine who is, who's innocent and who isn't. Okay. So you have that happen first. The, the defense is supposed to be doing its part. The prosecution is supposed to do its part. That doesn't always happen. 
but that's what should happen. Here's the other thing. When I talk about direct appeals being limited, this is a, an appeal that only allows the four corners of the record, meaning everything that is filed with the clerk's office, filed in court. So everything that is on the paper from the information or potentially your arrest all the way down to your conviction is what can be raised on direct appeal. If you have evidence outside of that, you can't raise it here. So if you have evidence that the prosecution withheld evidence, that's outside the four corners of the record. You can't raise that here. If you have evidence that your defense attorney didn't raise a proper defense for you, you can't raise that here. This is a very narrow appeal that is only based on what is on the transcript pages. Okay? And if you do not raise every claim that is on the transcript pages, did there was, was there a jury issue? Did there was a motion in limine to keep something out? Those kind of things. Was there a bail issue? Was there a competency issue? Was there something else that came up in the record that could be clearly discerned? Was there a suppression issue because of an illegal search or seizure? All of those go in here. Okay, anything that requires extra evidence does not come up in this in this appeal. So this is what I mean by your appeals do different things. And a lot of times people don't understand well, why can't I bring everything right now, because the court won't hear it. Most state courts will only listen to in this appeal what happened in the record itself. Okay. Second level of appeals, post-conviction. Here's the problem with post-conviction. You have to file with, you know, a state petition for writ of habeas corpus or sometime a motion for post-conviction relief. Each state is different. What Arkansas does is not what Oklahoma does, is not what Missouri does. Each state is different. You need to learn what each state requires as far as when you have to file it and what goes in it. Most of the time, any extra evidence claims go here. So if you have ineffective assistance of counsel, you're, you, know, you have you know, the police withheld evidence showing you were innocent, all of that goes here. If you do not raise it here, it's potentially waived meaning no one will ever hear it. So you have to raise it all here. If you don't raise it here, it's all waived. meaning you can never raise it again in state court. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem. So a lot of times I'll get people who ask me, can you represent me? I've already finished my post conviction and I just wanna ring, I just, I just like, I can't because you've waived everything. And it is almost impossible to get it back. So I'll explain that in a second. The next thing you would have is what's called an evidentiary hearing, which is a bench trial. It is your burden as an inmate to show to the court, and this is actually the same court that just convicted you. You're appearing before the same judge. You don't get a new judge. So you're going back to the same judge and you are explaining to the judge all the things that went wrong in your trial. So it's a, a bench trial, meaning there is no jury. It's the judge determining whether or not you have proven that there is a flaw in your conviction, that your conviction is in a violation of the constitution, either of the state or the US constitution or some other rule. Okay, so this is your burden. The burden is shifted to the inmate. Usually your post-conviction motion is denied and the process of repeats. <coughs> Please excuse me, sorry. I've been talking a lot today. Here's the problem with this. You don't have a right to counsel. There is no Sixth Amendment right to counsel here. 
you're doing this all pro se, meaning you're doing this from your prison cell. You don't have an attorney. You don't have an investigator. You are doing this on your own. And that is why the, la the vast majority of these claims fail because people don't know how to properly raise them. You don't have an attorney. You don't even have your transcripts most of the time. You don't know, you know, you, you may have just gotten to prison and you miss, your you, miss, you miss the window in which to file this. And under most state court rules, if you don't file it in time, you forfeit the whole process. Arkansas has a very narrow statute of limitations, either 60 to 90 days after your direct appeal is final. Most inmates aren't even at their permanent facility, much less have access to any of the materials necessary to file this. And that's a problem. Okay. Is there another question? I will get to the one about how do you just figure out who's who? Yeah, someone asked, are orders on motions in Lemine handled during pretrial or before that? Yes, they are, motions in Lemony are handled pretrial. And you should get an order or you should get a judge's ruling on those pretrial. So yes, anytime you file a motion as a defense attorney, you should actually make sure you get a ruling because that's something you can appeal in when we talked about the trial phase. So this is the second phase. So you have the trial phase, then you have post-conviction, and now we have the next phase, which is habeas, federal habeas in federal court, okay? But you do get to go through this process again. You go have your evidentiary hearing, you're denied, then you get to appeal to the state court of appeals or the Supreme Court, and then you get to go back up to the U.S. Supreme Court on a petition for writ of certiorari. Don't worry about the tolling of time. I'm not going to go into that tonight. Okay. Federal habeas corpus. This is the last level of appeals. Okay. And you can, in federal habeas, you can challenge state convictions and federal convictions. Usually when I'm doing a case, I'm challenging state convictions which is 28 USC 2254. That's the actual US code provision that allows for the habeas, um, habeas petition. And you would actually file in federal court a petition for writ of habeas corpus. What habeas corpus is, is a Latin phrase where the state has illegally detained my body, literally. So you are illegally being detained of your person in a prison. For petition for writ of habeas corpus to work, you have to be incarcerated. You have to be in some type of state custody. Even if you're on, you've had to register as a sex offender or whatever, that still counts as custody. You have to have the state have some control over you before the federal courts can get in, okay? So that's what you're challenging, that the, the state has control of your physical person in violation of the law. And again, you're doing this pro se, meaning by yourself. You don't have an attorney. And again, the process looks a lot like post-conviction. The problem is, and we'll get to this in a second, if you've had an evidentiary hearing in state court, you're probably not gonna get one here. They're not gonna give you two unless something radically happens in the case. You would then get an appeal potentially to the US Court of Appeals. In Arkansas, our Court of Appeals is the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. I'm not gonna get into the certificate of appealability. We would talk about that in the class. I'm not gonna talk about it now. And then again, the process repeats. Usually, the Supreme Court won't take your case on post-conviction because they know they're going to see it here at the end of federal habeas. So if they're going to take it, they're going to probably take it here. And then after that, the only other option available to you is state clemency, 
meaning the governor of your state would have to intervene to either com commute your sentence or pardon you, okay? And like I said, you only get an evidentiary hearing here if you didn't have one in state court. So how does this all look in practice? This is the whole chart. This is what happens for every felony charge goes through this chart. That's This is the whole thing together. All the way through what we talked about so you can see it all together. And understand your right to effective assistance of counsel is only in the first phase. It is only in the trial phase. It does not go through any other part. Okay, you don't have counsel in state post-conviction and you don't have counsel in federal habeas corpus. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop and just talk the rest of the way. So the first thing, and I've got some other slides, but I've, I'm come, I wanna have a conversation now. Let me go back to that question. So now you understand procedurally the problems we have in the system. How do you determine what's an innocence case and what's not? There is no miracle determination. You've got to work the case just like any other case. Meaning when I was running the Oklahoma Innocence Project and then before that, the Midwestern Innocence Project, you have to, there, there are some indications that you might have an innocence case, but you still got to read all the transcripts. You kind of look at the file see what's going on in the opinions and see if there's a potential problem there. Most cases have something that went wrong. Most of the people who are prosecuted in this country who are asking for assistance are poor, uneducated. A lot of them are people of color. Some of them have had brushes with the law before, okay? So, so it's not as if I can just wave a magic wand and say, this person's innocent, this person isn't. So when I was running the project, we had people fill out a 21 page questionnaire. And I would look at that questionnaire and kind of get an understanding of the case. And then I would start looking at some of the information in the case, the transcripts, the police reports to see what was the evidence that the state had against this person that led to conviction. If I am reading some of the information and I'm not seeing what they had, they just had eyewitness identification and that's it. That causes me to look at the case further. Or there was just a false confession and there's nothing else. That causes me to look at it further. Right now, the only two avenues an innocent person has to get assistance are either the innocence network, meaning you ask an innocence project to look at your case and they all have backlogs. It would take, I always tell people it would take, it takes at least two to three years before we even get to look at your case because you have that many people asking for assistance. The second is if you manage to get filed in court and you do it somewhat correctly and a judge potentially thinks there's something wrong there, they could ask and appoint someone to represent them. Those are usually the two ways you get counsel in post-conviction and habeas. It is not an easy road. And this is why I say it takes about five to seven years once someone starts working on the case to get an exoneration, okay? Because it takes so much longer. I see there's another question. Yeah. So are there NGOs devoted to petitions for writ of habeas corpus? NGO. Don't know what that means. Non-governmental organizations. Non oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, so yeah, so there's so other than innocence projects, 
Not often because public defenders offices and federal defenders offices are focused in on either the trial or appellate work. Now, I had the position of capital habeas attorney when I worked at the federal defender's office. And that was someone who represented capital people who had claims in federal court. That's how actually I first got my first innocence cases was death penalty cases where people were innocent. And that's how I realized the extent of the problem. But other than those two agencies, meaning innocence networks, or you find potentially attorneys who are willing to do this, there's not a lot of organizations who will just take these cases because they're expensive. Usually when I was running the project, we could spend at least 50 to $60,000 on a case. Meaning when you look at the experts that you need, and these are not DNA cases. You've got investigators that you've got to have. Even the students, you know, training them, letting them run around and find the witnesses and the documents and all of this stuff, it takes time. So this is not a, and, and the problem with why there's not a lot of private attorneys is there's no money in it. There's money once you get exonerated and you can file a civil suit, but to get there, there's no money in it, okay? So those are the procedural problems in this situation. There's also substantive problems, meaning what are the claims you raised? And I talked about something, you know, ineffective assistance of counsel, the, the prosecution withheld evidence, the police withheld evidence. They got a false confession. Either they beat it out of you or they fed it to you. There's numerous cases of that. There's bad forensic science. We just talked about one. That's Larry Youngblood, where he couldn't get the evidence to show he was innocent. That there are a myriad of other ways. Eyewitness misidentification also talked about. So these are the cases, these are, these are the claims that you would raise in a case to show that there was a wrongful conviction. And you would have to put it in a pleading, but you've got to do it in a way that someone actually can look at it and see why you're wrongfully convicted. So it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. There's no quick, easy way to solve this problem, unfortunately. Any other questions? Nope. Yeah, James, do you have a question? I see you raising your hand. Jump on in. Well, I still didn't get an answer on what percent. It is said that no one in prison admits that they're guilty. Oh, yeah, there's not a guilty man. No, there's not an innocent man in Shawshank. So, so you really didn't answer the question. What percentage of those who claim to be innocent are actually innocent? So it depends on the project that you're talking about. So when I was running Oklahoma, I would say probably I will. I would say the cases I looked at, if I had a hundred cases, I would say probably at least, I would say thirty percent of that. So thirty had some indication that there might be a problem. But until you actually fully get in and investigate and look at them, you can't know for sure. So I would say. I have one other uh, question okay, go ahead. about prosecutors. Do, if they stay in a long while, don't they drift toward, if I can get a conviction, I'm going to throw it at them. Closing, no. cases, closing case is more important than figuring out who's innocent and guilty. That's my question. Okay. So, so it depends on the prosecutor and it depends on the jurisdiction. I've worked with a lot of prosecutors who are willing to potentially look at a case years later. Um, I mean, we had a case that I, you know, worked on a little bit in Missouri, where the prosecutors were the ones trying to exonerate the guy. And it was actually the attorney general's office for the state who were saying we want to keep him in. So I would say there's a lot of prosecutors out there who, when confronted with the fact that they may have got the wrong guy, are willing to have a conversation and willing to potentially look at your evidence and talk to the Innocence Project or whoever the council is and try to fix the case. So I would say, yes, there are some prosecutors who are absolutely what you're saying, but not all of them. Let 
let me ask one that's probably on a lot of people's mind. In your experience, when you look at wrongful convictions, is this primarily a function of simply of what resources you have to bring to your defense? Or do you think that race plays a separate role in how likely someone is to be convicted or charged? I think it's both. So I, I will say we do as a system, a criminal justice system, do prosecute people of color exponentially to what their present potential population is. That, that doesn't change. But also in the network, you're going to see the vast majority of exonerations are people of color because they're overrepresented in the prison population. Yep. And if you're looking at that one to two percent, which is very conservative, that's potentially wrongfully convicted in any prison population, it's going to probably be people of color. Because usually the system is what breaks down there. So you're poor. They're, you're more likely to be poor, you're more likely to have brushes with the law. And that put the more brushes you have with the law, even if you have nothing like, you know, this is the New York City problem of stop and frisk. You have more potential brushes with the law, it's much more likely you're gonna get caught up in something, even if you don't do it. So I've represented many clients who, you know, no brush, you know, I got arrested for you know misdemeanor stuff, ticky tax stuff, and all of a sudden, boom, you get the big case, and then you're like, how you know you're in a you're in a situation where you've got a public defender's office that's overwhelmed with cases, they can't handle the cases properly, and you're off to the races. So that's usually what ends up happening is a combination of that. Dean Coon, that was terrific. Professor Murphy, wow. I know our students that are lucky enough to get a seat in your class are gonna have an, a really high-end experience. So um, yeah, I noticed we have a number of students who are uh, Zooming with us. What kind of qualities might, might you want to see in a student who applies for this class? So I'm giving them a little edge up. <laughs> okay. So, so what, what I'm looking for is a student who is not necessarily interested in like protect, you know, potentially practicing law. I get that. You can do that. You can go to law school. We have one down the street. I'm there. But, <laughs> but, but what I'm looking for is a conversation of, of a variety of students who want to understand how you deal with complex litigation. Because here's the thing, habeas is a civil action. I'm a civil attorney on a criminal map. Most of my time is doing civil litigation about criminal maps. Huh, interesting. Okay, and, that, and that's, that, that kind of doesn't always make sense to a lot of folks. So, so what I'm looking for is students who want to understand the criminal justice system a little bit more, but also want to understand people. Why, why is our system flawed? Why is it so hard to get this done? So I'm looking for people who have a variety of, of, of disciplines. When I was running the clinic with, un, with students, I had sociology people, I had psychology people, I had anthropologists in, you know, in my clinic. And that's important because how you look at a case is, is vastly different based on your experience. So I've had cases broken by anthropologists who looked at some like forensic information and were like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense here. Here's the problem you're not looking at. I'm not an anthropologist, I know nothing. But they were the ones who kind of said, you need to look at this, this, and this. And these are the things that I'm seeing in these police reports and these autopsy reports that give me pause. That's what potentially is interesting to me. I like people from a lot of different viewpoints who are asking questions. Yeah, no, that's actually perfect for the mission of these classes is that we bring together at your table an interdisciplinary crew. Um, so yeah, no, that's fantastic. All right, I will silence myself now. Um, I know we have, I do have a question here. How do we apply to be in the seminar? I'm going to uh, let John Treat answer that one, okay? 
if you go to honorshub.uart.edu right now and go to the academics pages in the courses section, you will see an application where you can apply for this and our other two signature seminars. Uh, let me give a sh shout out to Extractions with Tony Jensen, which will be looking at the cost of extractive industries on communities, particularly through an indigenous lens, and also on Climate Change, a Human Perspective with Ben Vining from Anthropology, who will be looking at the long range of climate change during the era of Homo sapiens. Uh, and also for up for applications, we have midterm elections with Dean Noah Pittman, which is sure to be another class people want to get in on. And then we have 12 more classes that all you've got to do is register early. So honorshub.uart.edu, academics, Honors College courses, that will get you to a link to the application. You'll need to fill out some basic information about how many hours you've taken, what your GPA is, and then to write a short essay question, which I think is limited to something like 2,000 characters, so not onerous, but put your best foot forward, and um, we will look forward to reading the apps uh, when things open up, when we get closer to early registration. We'll try to have those wrapped before early registration starts so that you can move on and um, select your courses knowing whether you're in or not. Yeah, and I've put the uh, actual website in the uh, oh, thank chat. You. And um, the other reason why we take applications is exactly what Professor Murphy said. We wanna see a class that has a wide range. Like we don't want all pre-law, yes. well, <laughs> pre-law is fine, but we would love to see engineers and you know people from business and ag business and you name it. We want it. <laughs> One of the purposes of these seminars is to mix things up, get students out of their discipline, out of their comfort zone. We think we've done a great job when we see students from all six of the academic colleges around the same table. Absolutely. So any other questions before I wrap it up? Well, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. And if you have any other questions, definitely reach out to me. My email address is tiffanym at uark.edu. Feel free to email me. Um, I am more than happy. I will try to get back to you. As uh, Associate D. Treat knows, our email can get a little overwhelming at times, but I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. And thank you so much for your time and have a good evening, everyone. All right. Well, thank you. That was really. That was superior. Terrific. I'm getting lots of that in the uh, chat. I'm not surprised. Um, this is going to be a, a memorable Honors College Forum. We're very pleased to have Professor Murphy teach with us in the fall. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, and everybody have a good evening. We'll be in touch, Professor Murphy. There's no escape from us. All right. Yeah. Take care. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you again. Bye, y'all. Dr. Tree. That was super. That was terrific. So I am. Thank you, Brian. You were fantastic. You were a pro. You need your own radio show. <laughs> That's true. Thank you. All right, y'all. Have a good evening. Everyone have a great night. Bye. See ya. Ciao. Ciao, ragazzi.